Yes, we are recording. Okay. Um, so I know we're having a snafu with, I think, the email that Steve sent out a little while ago. It had a link actually to your program from last week. So everybody's getting messages that the event that they're trying to register for or attend has already passed. And that's because it was the one that's already passed. It happened last week. So um, if, if you're not here, then uh, I'm sorry, too bad, so sad we, with this little snafu. Uh, fortunately, a, a bunch of us now, several dozen, dozen of us have figured this out and uh, re-registered for this event or what have you. So... Um, we're going to have to make sure we get the correct emails sent out and, and our heartfelt apologies for that. The good news is we've got a recording going, so uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get that recording going uh, in a, within a couple of days here. Uh, Steve Blythe is out of town. He's the one who hosts these normally. It's his Zoom account. Um, and so he, when he gets back in town or when he gets to some good Wi-Fi, he will process our uh, video and get it posted up. So uh, sorry about all that, but let's uh, kick this thing off, shall we? Uh, let me just share my proper screen here, and you should be seeing my screen. Uh, the, so tonight I thought I'd talk about service bulletins, airworthiness directives, and instructions for continued airworthiness. So uh, let's, well, let's get started here. Uh, let me click the right button over here. Uh, a little bit about me. I fly that little 182 over there. Uh, that's my fun flying, my real flying. And I, my nighttime job lately has been on a 787 flying around the Pacific Ocean quite a bit. So uh, that one pays the bills, but the real flying, the real fun stuff happens in that 182 over there. So uh, tonight, uh, here's a little bit of our flight plan. We'll be covering the, just a, a little bit of basics on this webinar and some of these documents in general. Uh, and the, the documents I chose to talk about in order to try to keep this down to kind of a manageable content amount is about service bulletins. And then uh, the, the title included airworthiness directives and instructions for continued airworthiness. Those are nice TLAs, uh, but there's a fourth one, fourth one that squeezes in the middle there called special airworthiness information bulletins, and that's an FLA. So um, I, I figured I'd squeeze that one in there. And these are all important documents that we need to be familiar with when we're talking about working on our airplanes or flying our airplanes uh, and, and assisting with the management, running, managing the, the uh, maintenance management of this equipment. So uh, start out with a couple of assumptions here, and then we'll move into some definitions and sources and compliance. And this is going to go back and forth quite a bit between these sources and compliance and the definitions of the various types of documents. And then I'll hit you with a couple examples of some things that I think are uh, pretty interesting and pretty enlightening. Um, before we move on any further, I will say we've got a Q&A feature. If you bring that up and if you have questions for me or for Gary, post them in that Q&A feature. And uh, Gary will from time to time bust into the conversation here and throw those questions at me if I don't happen to catch one. Hey, I, I see uh, one of my coworkers there from Philadelphia has already chimed in. Uh, thanks for, he's one of the guys who turns the wrenches on the jets I fly. So Thanks very much for what you do, Dave, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. I'll keep doing what I'm doing, and, and uh, maybe one of these days we'll meet. I, I do fly the 787. I know that gets through Philadelphia every now and again. So the Q&A feature, as you can see, is already working. Uh, if you don't really have a question, but you have a comment, you a little uh, peanut gallery kind of thing, you can use the chat window, and that works. Everybody should be able to see that back and forth. Uh, you can respond there, but uh, quite honestly, Gary and I have to divide our attention a little bit. We're not going to spend a lot of time paying attention on the, uh, the, um, the chat feature, mostly around that Q&A. So uh, a couple of assumptions to begin with here. Firstly, um, I am not an AMT. I'm not an aviation maintenance technician. I'm a pilot, and I know enough about myself. I, I'm not generally into a lot of introspection. Uh, but I will say that I know enough about myself to know that I should not be a mechanic. I should not be an airplane builder. Uh, I don't deal with experimental airplanes uh, other than to, I've flown in a couple of them. Uh, but I'm not a mechanic. I am not an expert on this stuff. Everything I've learned essentially about maintaining an aircraft, I've learned as a consequence of owning my own airplane for eh, about 15 or 16 years now. And um, getting some education, uh, Sometimes the easy way, just talking to people, sometimes the hard way, having to write some checks. And uh, we'll get into that just a little bit. So uh, starting with that caveat then, uh, 
I am assuming that most of us here are pilots and or owners of the aircraft that you fly, not necessarily AMPs. If you are an ANP, then thanks, welcome, and please chime in in, in the chat or the Q&A if I get something wrong. If you're not an ANP, you are an owner and you're working on your airplane, you need to work with your ANP. You need to have a relationship with that person who's basically your subcontractor. You're gonna hire this person to work on your airplane. And if you have questions on any of this stuff, bring it to that ANP. This is the person who's going to give you the signature in your logbook that's gonna satisfy the legalities of flying your aircraft. So it's really important that you too are on the same page. It's a team effort when it comes to maintaining these aircraft. And uh, it's important that you trust your team and count on them and send these questions to them as much as possible. Uh, next, I'm going to assume that we're talking about aircraft inside the United States. We're talking about U.S. civil registered aircraft. I'm not even going to touch maintaining an aircraft in another country or an aircraft from another country. They've got their own rules. I know even less about that than I know about the FAA rules. I'm talking about a standard aircraft. I'm not talking about an experimental aircraft. There's a whole lot of extra rules around experimentals. Uh, and if you built the airplane, obviously you know everything there is to know about that aircraft. So you should be able to work on it, and maintain it and inspect it. And, and indeed you are. That's about the extent of what I know about <laughs> working on a, dealing with a, an experimental aircraft. And finally, I'm talking about part 91 flying, the general aviation flying that most of us do in our little airplanes. I'm not talking about airlines. I'm not talking about cargo, charter, any of that kind of thing. So just your garden variety, a weekend warrior, if you will, in your 182 or Gary's Bonanza or whatever else you've got. And the last thing I'll say here is this is not an exhaustive program. I'm, I'm hoping to keep this to under an hour tonight. There is no way that I can possibly cover all these documents and a few more in less than an hour. So uh, this is meant to give you a little taste, a little sousson, if you will, of, of some of these documents that you should make part of your program for maintaining your own aircraft. So uh, let's start with a couple definitions here. Uh, I'll start out with money. <laughs> this is a very like important the part. Poll. Uh, the, yes, you can go ahead and fire off a poll here. We're gonna uh, send a poll out here real quick. You can answer that. Uh, as you're in your leisure, you can move it over to the side if it's covering your, your screen a little too much. Uh, but a little fun stuff to start with here. Money. Uh, that is uh, any, any item or verifiable record that accepted as payments for goods and services. And if you have ever owned an aircraft, operated an aircraft, maintained an aircraft, you know that it's not Bernoulli, it's not Hunter Low Lead, it's not anything else that make it, it's not the four forces, you know, the lift thrust, all that stuff, that's all nothing. What makes an airplane fly is money. The more money you have, the bigger you can fly, the faster, the higher, the farther you can fly, the more you can carry. So, and, and often when we're uh, talking about working on airplanes, we deal with an, a unit of money called an AMU. You may have seen this somewhere. And an AMU is an aviation monetary unit. That's the smallest unit of cash in aviation. Pretty much if anything happens, you're gonna break out an AMU that's right now the current uh, transaction conversion fee is about $1,000 is an AMU. So we got the results in from the poll here. Uh, so most of us, two thirds of us are operating a standard category airplane and, and about 11% there experimental, that's good. Uh, and we got about a quarter, a little over a quarter of us uh, don't own an aircraft. So uh, what I will say about that is if, even if you don't own an aircraft, it's important that you know this stuff or at least some of this stuff so that you can talk intelligently with the person whose airplane you're renting or borrowing or, or what have you. Uh, if you don't own the aircraft, you're a little bit more limited in what you can do. Uh, Gary talked about some of this last week. It's covered in, in the, the FAR's part 43 is the, the uh, part that covers maintenance. And it talks in there about an owner operator of the aircraft can conduct maintenance on it. So if you don't own the aircraft, you are not allowed to, to work on it at all, really. Uh, and you can do anything under the supervision of a mechanic though. So that's part of why you need to have this relationship. Uh, the next question I asked was if you part, participate in the maintenance of your aircraft. And so a bunch of you said you don't own an airplane, that's fine. Uh, let's see, uh, about, about a, an eighth, about a little over 10% here. Uh, you hand over the keys and you write a check to your mechanic. And I know lots of people who are like this, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it tends to be a little bit more expensive, though. 
Um, the, the mechanic might come up with some issue. And if you say, hey, uh, just fix it for me, uh, you're going to probably end up with an invoice coming out the other end of it that's a little bit bigger than what you bargained for. Uh, one of the uh, mechanics and IAs I used for a number of years on my airplane said, if you do your own maintenance or assist in the, your own maintenance on your aircraft, you might not save any money, but it's likely you'll get a better airplane out the other side of it because you're more intimately involved and maybe you care about things. And an example for me was I got frustrated by the variety of fasteners that were attaching various fairings on my airplane one year. So I went out and I changed them all. Now they're all the same kind of fastener as much as I could. Uh, and uh, so oh, the other good news here, we've got about almost half of us uh, participate in owner assisted inspections like annual inspections. And I really encourage this. We'll touch on this a little bit later, but I think it'll make you a better pilot. It'll certainly make you a better owner. Uh, but as I just said, it probably won't save you any money, but you get a better airplane out of it at the end of the day. And uh, that's the way I do it. I open up all the panels to my aircraft. I do all the routine maintenance that I'm allowed to do. And then I call my mechanic up, my IA, and he will come over and perform the inspection for me. So uh, let's see, I'll close that. Do you need to hide that window there, Gary, that polling window? Uh, we've done the share results. I thought I did, but I can go ahead. And... Okay, maybe it's just showing up on my screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, we've got the Aviation Monetary Unit. It's a thousand bucks. Uh, and you'll see this it's talked about in a lighthearted fashion in a lot of, of type clubs. And let me just take a moment to say, if you own an aircraft or if you fly a particular type of aircraft more often than others, you really should be a member of whatever type club exists for that aircraft. You'll be surrounded by other owners who own similar airplanes. And I guarantee you, there is almost nothing that you can do on your airplane that somebody else hasn't already run into. And they might have a good solution for you, a, a better way to do it, a source for parts or a technique or what have you. Those type clubs are invaluable when you're operating and, and maintaining your airplane. So the, uh, the meat of the discussion tonight, though, is going to be on these SBs, SAIBs, ABs, and ICAs. So basically, the bottom line here is when you see one of these come across your inbox or in your mailbox, the FAA has made a, a very exacting determination. You have too much money in your wallet, and it's time to spend some. So these things are almost never free. Uh, they, they always cost at least a little bit of money along the way, but you'll probably end up with a better aircraft out of it. So let's start with a service bulletin. Uh, it's got a couple of various types of names to it, but basically a service bulletin comes from the manufacturer of the uh, whatever it is, the aircraft, the engine, the propeller, an appliance. Um, and this is going to inform you as a hopefully a registered owner of that component that there's a product improvement coming along. Hey, we think your airplane, your radio, your whatever will be better if you comply with the, the description in this service bulletin. So uh, it's a good idea to sign up for these or, or find them uh, when other people reference them. Look these up and read through them. They might have some good information for you. Uh, they also sometimes come in an alert format or sometimes called a mandatory service bulletin. And this is issued when they determine that there's an unsafe condition that happened to your airplane. Your manufacturer has, has discovered this and they think that this is enough of a safety related issue uh, that you need to really sit up and take notice of this and, and you should probably look it over and determine how and whether you're going to, uh, to implement the recommendations in this document. So the important thing I wanna point out here is that this service bulletin has come from the manufacturer of this product. And that's different than the other things we're gonna see in a moment. So uh, since it comes from the manufacturer, it doesn't really have any weight of law behind it. So the compliance or adherence to the provisions of these service bulletins are not necessarily mandatory. They're not, there's no legal requirement to do them, even if it says it's a mandatory service bulletin. Uh, there is an exception to that that I'll, we'll get to in just a little bit. So that transitions as, as on, uh, got any questions or chat coming up here, Gary? Uh, I don't see any at the moment. Uh, no, no questions yet. Megan okay. raised her hand, but I asked her to post her question on. Yeah, we, yeah. It, with this webinar format, we, we can't hear you and we can't turn your camera on. So that's why we, we ask you to use the chat or, or the Q&A if you have a question. So... Uh, the next level up is called a Special Airworthiness Information Bulletin, or an SAIB. And this is a document that comes from the FAA. 
and their uh, requirements or their advisory circular and their, their order, the FAA order that talks about these says that this is an informational tool that alerts, educates, and makes recommendations uh, about the safety of your aircraft. But they contain non-regulatory information and guidance that does not meet the criteria for an airworthiness directive. So again, the, the necessity to comply with or implement the provisions of one of these SAIBs is not mandatory. It hasn't met the criteria yet for an airworthiness directive. Still, probably a really good idea. And I'm going to give you an example of one of these here in a little bit. Uh, so this is why it's important to tune in and be aware of when these things are, are coming your way and, uh, and kind of bring them into your scan and at least be familiar with them. So the next level up is an airworthiness directive. And this is the one that's really, is, depending on what the issue is, it can be serious. Anything from, uh, if you had a propeller that was overhauled by a certain propeller shop, we had this a few years ago, 15 years or so ago, I remember. It was a propeller shop that was using bad parts in overhauls and they came out with an emergency AD that said, you gotta replace that propeller or at least have it overhauled again. So it ranges from something like that all the way up to, you're probably familiar with a little issue that started a little while back on the Boeing 737. They grounded the entire fleet for two years. That was an emergency airworthiness directive. So that's kind of the other end of these. They, they can be very serious. So uh, these are legally enforceable rules that apply to, again, to an aircraft, to an engine, a propeller, or appliances. Uh, and by appliances, we mean basically anything that's installed inside the airplane. Uh, and it, uh, an example of that was a couple of years ago when Avidyne came out with their IFD 540 navigators, there was an airworthiness directive that said that you couldn't execute certain types of approach. There was a, a bug in the software that caused the approaches to be improperly displayed and navigated, and it could lead to a safety issue. So they said, you can't do an instrument approach using uh, that uh, navigator. So uh, these essentially have the power of an, an FAR. They, all the airworthiness directives become a part of the regulations to part 39. So uh, they're issued by the FAA when an unsafe condition exists in the product and when they determine that it's, it's likely to exist or develop in other products of the same design. And put a pin in that, I'm gonna talk about it, but what, they're, what they mean is we see a problem here and we think it's very likely that it can be a problem with that one and that one and that one over there. So we think everybody who's operating and owning and operating this aircraft needs to be aware of this. So here it is. So uh, the last document we're going to talk about is an instruction for continued airworthiness. And uh, here's the description on that. This is just documentation that gives instructions and requirements for ongoing maintenance uh, for whatever, again, the, the aircraft, the engine, the propeller, uh, appliances, and so forth. Uh, they help keep the product airworthy, whatever it is. Uh, there will be enhanced instructions on uh, various types of, of maintenance, maybe even products you can use to help uh, make cleaning products, for instance. Uh, so processes and procedures. This is additional information that will help you maintain the airworthiness of your fill in the blank, whatever it is, your aircraft, your engine, your propeller. So uh, let's go back to service bulletins for a minute. And uh, this is where just a moment we're going to, uh, actually this one it doesn't have the link I'm going to post. Um, but the sources for these service bulletins, uh, the best sources I've found are manufacturers' websites or, or Google. You can just Google ICA for whatever your component is. And uh, within a few clicks, you'll probably find the document you're looking for. Quite often, the service bulletin is going to be a part of the installation manual, for instance, for whatever component it is. Sometimes it's an additional document. It, it kind of comes in a few different flavors. Uh, and it's a fairly new thing that was in it, it, the idea for it was first uh, arrived at in, in the mid 90s or so. So they've only been around for about 25 years, give or take. Um, and, and it's great information that you can use to help maintain your equipment in a better uh, state. So as far as compliance, uh, like I mentioned earlier, th these are not FARs. They don't carry the weight of the FAA behind them. Um, but again, it's a good idea. Uh, it's, uh, um, they will help your airplane be a, a better airplane out the other side of it. Uh, and the exception to this is sometimes you'll see a service bulletin that's generated again by the manufacturer and when the FAA determines there's a bad enough situation that we really need to make sure that everybody does this, 
Uh, for instance, the example I list there is, is the Cessna 210, uh, the carry through spar inspection that came out about a year ago. Um, in that airworthiness directive, it referenced procedures and tools and methods that were defined in the service bulletin. So this is the case where the service bulletin becomes mandatory. And uh, you, that's one method of compliance with the airworthiness directive, and there, there may be others, uh, but this is, is the classic example of that. It's not all that common for a service bulletin to be referenced by an AD in, in my experience, but it's often enough, and it's just one of those things you should be familiar with. Okay, we mo moving back up to the uh, special airworthiness information bulletins, and Gary, if you will, uh, he's going to uh, cut and paste a, that link into the chat box there. Hopefully, you can uh, save it out of there. Uh, because the SAIBs come from the FAA, um, the FAA maintains these SAIBs. So uh, when you go to that website, you're going to get a, a page that looks something like this. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that, but you can type in a, a search term in that search box and it will show up, it'll show you all the SAIBs that apply to that particular search term. Or you can look by, and if you know the number of the SAIB or the equipment that it was associated with, you can look at that and it'll give you a list of all these items and then you can go find the document and, and research it and get familiar with it. So, uh, how about compliance? Uh, I said a moment ago that uh, these now are an FAA um, a tool or document. These don't come from the manufacturer, but uh, the FAA order that, that tells manufacturers how to create these SAIBs have this sentence in there in this order that says, these are non-regulatory, non-mandatory information and guidance. So again, not critical, they can't make you do it, but it's a really good idea that you get familiar with these and, uh, and implement them. Um, so the uh, process for these normally when, when an airworthiness directive is, is under consideration, uh, here's the process. They will make a, a proposed, they'll propose this AD as an NPRM, a notice of proposed rulemaking, and they'll publish it out to the universe. And normally there's a comment period associated with this, 60 days quite often I, I see, sometimes 90, sometimes they'll extend it. And this is when you really start to pick up the attention of the aerospace industry press. And this is when your tight club will send out an email or a, a notice or publish it in their magazine that, hey, there's an NPRM for an AD coming down the pike. If you have any experience with your aircraft and this issue, you might want to comment on this. So you see this all the time uh, when it moves on to the next level. If you read the final level of the, this airworthiness directive, they will go through every comment they received from somebody who submitted a comment on it. And they will discuss whether this was an important one, uh, what they did with this comment. If they uh, just um, disay if they discard the comment or if they're going to implement it or, or here's why we're going to or not going to implement that particular comment. Here's why we think it was important or not. So after this 60 day period or 90 or whatever, then the FAA will mull all this stuff over and their team that's working on the AD just churns it all down and they make a document and they publish the final airworthiness directive. And uh, those of you again with the 210 that you probably saw that uh, SB and then SAIB about that wing spar inspection. And then it became a proposed NPRM and people commented about it. And then it became a final NPRM. And now when it's a final NPRM, there's a date that says this airworthiness directive has to be compli complied with by a certain date. Or sometime, sometimes it's a number of hours in service. That's what I ran into on my 182 a few years ago. There was an airworthiness directive against the cylinders that we had installed in our airplane that allowed them to be flown up to 1,200 hours. So mine were at about 1,050. So I had another 150. And uh, just over 1,100, uh, we ended up with a burn valve in one cylinder, and we decided just to change them all out. So uh, it, it, occasionally here, the, the final bullet I have there is the emergency AD. And this says, you cannot fly this airplane. Or, or maybe you can fly at one leg to, from wherever it is over to a place where the, this air readiness directive can be complied with at the most. But this is a pretty serious thing. And when they have an emergency AD, the, the, the example is that 737 AD that grounded the entire fleet, uh, there was no 
a process by that. It, it didn't go through this proposal and, and then comment period and then the final. It just said on, okay, it, it's Tuesday today. These airplanes are all grounded as of tomorrow. So that's a big hammer. And they, thankfully, this doesn't happen all that often, but it's a serious enough issue at that point. The FAA, FAA feels very strongly that uh, this has to be done right now. So when it comes down to these ADs, uh, there's a couple of different types and they kind of sort out in a couple of different ways. You might have a one-time AD or you might have a recurring AD. So a one-time AD would be if there's something you can replace that will then, it'll, it's a known good part now. It's not a questionable part, for instance. If you replace that questionable part with a good one, now the AD is done, it goes away. An example of this would be Moonies. Uh, some of the older Moonies have a propeller hub inspection that was re required every year. It would require a, a, um, an eddy current inspection of the hub. So this is a recurring AD that's going to happen as long as you own that propeller hub. And if you then replace that propeller with another one, a newer one, now it's complete and it's done and, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, another example of a recurring AD that I have to worry about, I have a couple on my airplane I have to worry about, the uh, Cessna seat track AD is a real common one. Now every year, or every hundred hours, you have to inspect the seat tracks and the attachment points on the seats for wear and replace the tracks and, and the, the components if they get too worn. So uh, these airworthiness directives, and here's the time for the second link there. Uh, th these really come out of the federal register. And this is, <laughs> it's kind of a pain to, to find them in the federal register. I, I got an example here I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, so Gary, if you'll post that link in the chat there for everybody. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the federal register, in case you're unaware that this is a document that comes out of, of Congress on a daily basis, basically. This is published with all sorts of the rules and regulations that come out of every government agency is documented in there. So here's, here's an example. This is the page that has the seat track. Is this a seat track? Um, no, this is the oil filter, uh, the spin on oil filter adapter assembly airworthiness directive I have in my Cessna. So <laughs> you look at this page and the first thing you see is, hey, look, here, here's a, a part on fresh cut flowers and fresh cut greens. This is the problem with the federal register is it's everything. This is your one-stop shop for any regulation from any government agency. So uh, we don't care about fresh cut flowers and fresh cut green uh, promotion in, in this particular industry, but we do care about airworthiness directives. So literally on the same piece of paper, the same set of pixels, over in the couple columns over is this airworthiness directive on the spin on oil filters. So it's just kind of an interesting, uh, kind of a, a pain way to, to find it. Uh, the FAA also has an airworthiness directive search capability. If you go to this website, you'll get a page like this and uh, you, you can type in, let me see if I can get this to work here. You got a search bar here, you can type in uh, some search terms. So for instance, on this day, I, I happen to type in Avidyne. I was curious about that airworthiness directive on the Avidyne navigators uh, for doing uh, approaches where the final approach segment, it's a long story, but you can search on various things. Uh, so that may, might make it a little bit easier to find what you're looking for. It, it, sometimes it's, it's a matter of finding the needle in the haystack and sometimes it's a matter of finding the haystack to begin with. So here's your haystack. Uh, another thing I'll point out is down here, you can look at the emergency ADs down at the bottom, it, it, it's a, a tab here you can click on. If there's a, a brand new emergency AD, you go to that tab and it'll show them all. Uh, if you're current, if you're interested in recent airworthiness directives, here's the 111 of them now passed in the last 60 days. So they've been busy with their ADs. Uh, just uh, under COVID here, we haven't met, might not have been flying a whole lot, but uh, boy, the ADs have been coming out. So, uh, and that last column over here is all current ADs by make and model almost 16,000 of those. So there's a bunch. This is a huge haystack. So you need to use the tools available. Uh, if your uh, IA that you use for your annual inspections is worth his salt, he'll subscribe to a service for searching for ADs. And so that way it becomes a standard part of his routine. And uh, with a little luck, he'll have your aircraft and all your components, all your appliances programmed into this search. And he can just do a search for your tail number and it'll list all the ADs that apply to everything that's installed in your airplane. So that, that's great as far as it goes, but if you do an avionics overhaul and you replace all your old King avionics with new Garmin GTNs and whatnot, you need to let him know so he knows to be on the lookout now for a Garmin uh, uh, GTN type 
airworthiness directive. So uh, compliance with airworthiness directives is mandatory basically. Now it, it has become an FAR. It's, it's entered into the, the Federal Aviation Regulations in Part 39. Now you got to do it. So you, even if it doesn't apply to your airplane, I'm going to show you how we do that in just a minute. Uh, you need to at least look at it and make a determination as to whether this airworthiness directive applies to the stuff you've got. So uh, when you log these ADs, they need to be logged annually, and they should also be logged upon completion if it's a recurring type AD. So there needs to be some notification in the paperwork for the aircraft that this AD is, is done. So here's an example. Uh, this is my aircraft. This is the document that my mechanic gives me after the annual inspection each year. This is just a couple months ago. It's a list of every AD that's ever been issued against the Cessna 182 and the, the engine and so forth. So uh, like here's a flasher switch. Uh, so AD 59-10. So this AD was issued in 1959. You know, what's that? 60 something years ago. And we still need to look and say, okay, this is NA by SN of airframe. So this AD does not apply. It's not applicable by serial number of airframes. So doesn't apply to my airplane, but it's been checked. Uh, the next one down, fuel injection, uh, injection pump needle. Uh, this is 1970. NA by SN of engine. My engine is a carbureted engine. It's not a fuel injected engine. So that one doesn't apply to me. And so on down the list. So uh, here's one from 1976, uh, Bendix switches. Uh, so date and hours at completion. So we completed this one in, uh, on March 1st at 6,019 hours. We complied with, there's a lot of acronyms. Mechanics just love acronyms. So CW means it's complied with. IAW means in, uh, in oh gosh, in, yeah, what is it, Gary? Help me out here. Uh, basically, in accordance with. Sure. So it, it's been complied with in accordance with PAR1 and no defects found at this time uh, due again in 100 hours. Now, this is really not the way it should be entered in your airframe logbook. I've had this explained to me by uh, maintenance inspectors. They say, don't say it's due in 100 hours. Say what tack time it's due by. So you look at the tack, you add 100 hours to it uh, for whenever it was needed to be done. So this one is due again at 6119.3. Uh, so annually or in 100 hours, and there's the time. So uh, that's the idea with that. And what I wanted to pull out was a specific example here. Uh, this is that oil filter uh, adapter airworthiness directive I was talking about a moment ago. Uh, this one has to do with this adapter is attached to the engine and there's a great big nut, a jam nut that holds this against the engine. So you screw the adapter in and you tighten this jam nut now to, to keep it from rotating and then you safety wire it into place. And then you put some torque putty across this joint from the adapter over this jam nut onto the engine. And the idea with this torque putty is if this thing has gotten torqued at all and it's disconnected for whatever reason, that torque putty will break and it'll let you know that this has moved. And as you can imagine with an oil adapter that's moving, if it moves too much, you're gonna get an oil leak out this thing. And if you lose the oil, then you got an engine failure could lead to a loss of the airframe. And that, indeed that's what the airworthiness directive says. So in this case, my oil filter adapter was inspected that same date and time, notice there, inspected oil filter adapter in accordance with paragraph B, no defects noted at this time. Do at next oil filter change or 100 hours. And again, this is in the uh, recurring, uh, the box is checked there for the recurring AD uh, column. And it's due at this hours and uh, or next oil filter change. So just the act of removing the oil filter and reattaching it can loosen this adapter. So it's necessary to make this inspection every time. So... Uh, Gary talked about last week that you could change your oil in your airplane, right? And that's something an owner can do. And I, I was doing uh, one of my first oil changes in my airplane, and I got to thinking about this. I said, wait a minute. Now, this here's an airworthiness directive that requires an inspection that needs to be logged in the logbook as this inspection having been completed. But I'm not a mechanic. I'm not an IA. Can I sign that off? And here's what, the, uh, what my entry looks like. Uh, this is a couple of years ago. I happened to find a nice clean one here. So here's the tack time, engine and oil filter change. I remove and replace the oil filter, complied with AD 961222 by inspection. 
do next engine oil filter change? And then we serviced it with the oil, we ran it and we leak check, okay. So you log that in there and I got to thinking, wait a minute, can I log that? And the answer is in the airworthiness directive, you need to read this AD and get familiar with what's in it. And in the case of this AD, here's the language. It says the repetitive inspections may be performed by the owner operator holding at least a private pilot certificate as authorized and so forth, and must be entered to the aircraft record showing compliance with this AD. So the AD itself tells you that I can do it. So there's your authority to do it. If it doesn't say something like this, you can't do that AD. Like the seat track inspection AD in my airplane doesn't say this. It has to be done by an inspector. So I don't even think a, a garden variety mechanic can do it, an AMP mechanic can do it. I think it has to be done uh, by somebody with the IA, with the inspection authorization. So uh, yeah, uh, interesting stuff, huh? Um, let me see, there is a question there. Uh, John is asking about German LBA use technical notes for service bulletin equipment information off a takes. Um, yeah, and this is why early on I said, I'm only gonna talk about maintaining US civil registered airplanes in the US. I'm not gonna talk about foreign entities because those rules are all different. Some of them do, I believe Canada and a lot of the, the EASA uh, countries do mandate that if there is a service bulletin or an SAIB that has the weight carries all the, the weight and legal authority of an airworthiness directive. So um, my recommendation there is if you're dealing with a foreign country government, get a foreign licensed mechanic in that country who's familiar with the rules there and uh, do what they say. And do what he say. So best practices. I suggest that you get copies of all the airworthiness directives that apply to your airplane and read them for yourself. They're actually written pretty much in plain English as a general rule. Um, it might, you know, if you're having an insomnia problem at two in the morning, it's a good time to break out a couple ADs and read through, read through there. And if you can't get to sleep after that, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but read them and ask questions. This is where the type groups come really in, in handy. You can get online. Most type groups will have a maintenance forum or, or forums uh, it's a great place to ask these kinds of questions. Hey, what's your experience with this AD? And uh, they'll tell you, you've got a bunch of free help there. Of course, sometimes it's worth everything you paid for it. Um, but uh, it, it's good to know this kind of thing. Um, and so get involved with this stuff. It can't hurt. So here's your example progression. That the way these things normally work is a manufacturer will determine that there, there's some possible improvement for your aircraft or maybe even a thing that, um, that it becomes a safety of flight issue and they think it deserves attention. So they'll publish this, this service bulletin. Uh, then it will become a special airworthiness information bulletin. It might even become an airworthiness concern sheet. I didn't include that in the documentation. You know, there's only, only so many hours in a day. Uh, but for instance, I'll hold up here. I have an airworthiness concern sheet that was published a little while back for my 182. Uh, this one is actually on the engines. Uh, and it had to do with engines. Um, it, it had, this one had to do with a belt-driven supercharger and so forth. Well, I don't have one of those installed on my airplane, so I didn't worry too much about that. Uh, but it, it indicates that the FAA has some concern about the airworthiness of this fill-in-the-blank aircraft, engine, propeller, whatever. Um, and it, it's, it's about to become an airworthiness directive, so sit up and pay attention and, and uh, get your ducks in a row. So I'm gonna illustrate this progression with a, a series of, of events here. Uh, here was the kickoff event back in 2014, Parma, New York, a gentleman's out flying his Cessna 140 and uh, he'd owned it for a number of years. He, he was not a newbie by any stretch, uh, but he was out practicing takeoffs and landings and something happened. He was out at his own uh, private ranch strip, uh, had a runway excursion, the airplane flipped over. I mean, look at that, the airplane is basically intact. Looks like a completely survivable event, right? Uh, you know, maybe a sore neck, maybe a little bruised shoulder or something like that. But here's what they found in the investigation was uh, uh, th they issued this service bulletin for a seat belt bracket inspection. They wish to update the seat belt bracket for airplanes in the field to the latest design. And if you go and, and read this whole service bulletin, the issue was that when they originally built this, the little attach point that the two front seat uh, seat belts attached to was made of aluminum. 
Uh, worked great at the time, uh, not a bad thing, uh, but they're old now. That Cessna 140 was from 1946 and 47. Uh, and they come to find out that the, this metal wears over time. And indeed, that's what happened in this accident. The, the seatbelt attach point broke. So now, instead of being belted securely to the seats, the pilot became a, a dead weight flying around in this accident. He broke his neck. So Cessna issued the service bulletin on February 17th of 2015. So a few months after the accident, maybe six months or so after that accident. The next thing to happen, two months later, April 15th, the FAA published this SAIB. And it says, hey, uh, it's come to our attention. We got an airworthiness concern with these aluminum seat belt mounting brackets affecting all Cessna 120 and 140 airplanes. We, uh, they, Textron Aviation issued this service bulletin dated February 17 to address this concern. Now, so the FAA says, uh, we agree with Cessna. This is an issue that you need to be concerned with and you should probably address this in your airplane. Uh, at this time, the airworthiness concern is not an unsafe condition that would war warrant airworthiness directive action. So they think it's pretty serious, but it's not quite to the level yet of an AD. So put a pin in that. So fast forward a couple of years, this is last uh, July. Uh, this is up in uh, Vancouver, uh, near Vancouver, British Columbia. This is a friend of mine was flying this airplane. She was killed in this accident. Uh, she was, a, a, I believe she had her commercial ticket instrument rating. She owned for a while, she owned a flight school in the Vancouver area. Very experienced pilot, some 12, 1300 hours. Uh, she had spent a month flying with Sparky Imason, learning the ins and outs of mountain flying. Uh, she had been into this airport several times this summer already. Uh, and on this, in, this event, she was sitting in the right seat with a friend of hers in the left seat. And they had a runway excursion during a takeoff out of this field. And here's what they found in the investigation. There's that seat belt bracket. This is the original bracket made out of aluminum and it broke. And uh, Cessna told us this was gonna happen and they told us you should replace this with the steel part and this one had not been replaced. It was not required to be replaced. So it was not a big deal, but you read through the accident report and it says right here, this is similar to that other accident that we saw in the United States. It shows that without the incorporation of the steel lap belt center bracket, and that's the way they spell center up there, failure of the aluminum lap belt during accidents may continue potentially resulting in serious or fatal injuries. What do you know? So they said it was serious. The FAA didn't quite think so. They didn't make an AD out of it. Um, but now fast forward to two days ago. Some of you may be familiar with this accident in Arizona. A, a young couple, they were YouTube people. They, they had a YouTube channel where they shared their passion and love for flying. They had just bought this airplane. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened. It wasn't on an airport. Uh, this again, looks like yeah, maybe it's a little hard to tell here, but maybe a survivable accident. Um, but I predict, uh, I haven't gotten any, I've asked this question of some people closer to this event than I am. If they could look at that seatbelt bracket, what was the state of it? If that was an original aluminum bracket, if it hasn't been replaced, and if it broke in this accident, I'll bet you a dollar there will be an arrhythmus directive on this item, uh, probably within a couple of months. Uh, I think this is going to get fast tracked to the, to the end here. So uh, that's the normal progression. That's uh, the recommended thing. And this is why I think it's important to sit up and take notice when an SB or an SAIB is issued and you should get familiar with what's in it and take care of it. So let's move on now to the instructions for continued airworthiness. And this again is something that, that these instructions are published by the manufacturer of whatever the item is. Uh, Typically, we see a lot of this in, in appliances, radios, uh, radio gear, uh, but we'll take a, a little look at it in just a second here. Um, but they'll give you instructions so that you can maintain these components in the best form so that uh, they'll last you a long time and give you good service. So that they help keep the product airworthy. There's, there's inspections, methods, and so forth involved in these, these uh, ICAs. Um, so the source is, because these don't come from the FAA, they come from the manufacturer, the best source for these is the, the manufacturer. Look at the type certificate or the supplemental type certificate. 
Uh, these have been required to be installed in, or, or included in your maintenance issues uh, with these, this equipment for a little over 20 years now. So uh, look around for them and you should get familiar with them. Uh, we'll, and we'll circle back to that in just a second. So here's an example. Uh, a few years ago, we put in a Zeftronics voltage regulator in my 182. We were having issues with the, the original one. And this is the ICA for that Zeftronics voltage regulator. It basically says, there's nothing you can do to this. It's not field repairable. So if you have a problem with it, send it to Zeftronics. That's basically the entirety of the instructions for continued airworthiness. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have uh, this one. Let's see, this is the uh, Garmin 345 transponder. Uh, and this one is about seven pages long. So it's a little bit more in detail and I'm not gonna go into all the stuff here, but you can see here's your, it's got a section on limitations, on servicing information, uh, maintenance intervals, visual inspection, tells you how to do all that stuff. So now we're up to seven pages for a transponder. And uh, so if you're not doing this stuff, then technically your, your transponder is not airworthy. Uh, compare that to, uh, let's see, this one. This is the ICA for the plane power alternator that we put in my airplane about 10 years ago. It's a little bit more involved, but it says every year or every 100 hours, you're supposed to remove the belt, turn the alternator, make sure the bearings are okay. And every five years or 1,000 hours, um, remove the field brush assembly and inspect the brushes for excess wear. That's fair enough. Pretty simple, probably pretty obvious. And this compares to AMSAFE. These are the instructions for uh, a state-of-the-art restraint system, inflatable uh, uh, seatbelt assembly, basically. This instructions for continued airworthiness document is 100 pages long <laughs> So for a seatbelt. So they, they run the gamut. Uh, that's probably half the cost of the seatbelt is just in publishing this instructions for continuing airworthiness document. Uh, so again, the source for these is the manufacturer will, will come up with a, a, the type certificate or the STC or Google is a good place to find this. I, I looked at several of them when I was preparing for this. Uh, compliance, uh, essentially the instructions for continued airworthiness become an addendum or an appendix to your annual inspection checklist on your airplane. So this should be in a binder, a document that's provided to the, uh, the mechanic the, with inspection authorization who's going to conduct your inspections. Uh, this essentially becomes an extension to that. So they are required. So here's an example. I'll show you uh, just a couple things. This is the ICA for a Garmin 500W series. This is the navigator I have in my airplane. I, I've been doing a series of webinars on uh, the Garmin 430 and 530. You may have seen those online. Uh, you can Google my name and on YouTube and or, or go to YouTube and look at my name and you'll find these. But this is the instructions for continued airworthiness. It's about seven pages. Uh, and there's a couple interesting things I pulled out of here. Uh, one is just basic cleaning of the, the, the equipment. Uh, you can clean it with a soft cloth, cotton cloth dampened with clean water. Don't use any chemical cleaning agents. And you may have seen I know Max Trescott did a, a podcast about this with some video uh, about a year ago uh, when the COVID thing first happened and people started getting all these fancy cleaners to try to disinfect their airplane. And an enterprising young student pilot went out there to clean the instrument panel. I don't know what he used, but it caused serious damage to the interior of that airplane. So it's important to know what are approved tools and, and materials that you can use to maintain this stuff in its best form. So, you know, be careful not to scratch it. Also buried in there is operation is not permitted unless an inspection as described in this section has been completed within the preceding 12 calendar months. So every annual inspection. If you're not doing this inspection, technically speaking, your Garmin navigator is not airworthy. So you're supposed to conduct a visual inspection of the unit and it's wire harness. And this is probably what happens, uh, what's not happening is people aren't looking back behind it to make sure that your, your wiring is still okay, uh, that the routing is, your, the wiring routing is okay and the attachment clamping is okay. If you're not doing that, your, your 530, 430 is not airworthy. Probably similar paragraphs in ICAs for other navigators as well. Uh, it also tells you that uh, if you are going to modify your aircraft with this equipment here, you need to include this document in the maintenance information provided to the, the uh, and, and make it part of your maintenance programs. That's what I was talking about a moment ago, that basically 
these come to uh, become a, an addendum to the annual inspection checklist on your airplane. So uh, interestingly here, a question that popped up last week uh, was, can you replace the navigation uh, database card in your navigator without a logbook entry? The answer is yes, you can. It doesn't require one. But notice the, the updating and replacing this navigation card is not in the instructions for continued airworthiness. It, it's just not there. It is in the pilot operating handbook. It, actually, one of the appendices has about two pages, about a page and a half on how to remove and replace the navigation database card. So it's not considered preventive maintenance to update that database is the bottom line. So you don't have to log it. You don't have to be anybody special to do it. Uh, your, your mechanic in the shop can do it or, or the secretary behind the desk can do it in a training airplane, as long as they have a process in place to do that. So uh, what do we got for questions here? Um, we've got, okay, back to the German thing. Um, yes, um, yeah, a German manufactured aircraft in the US. So an example of this, I, I don't know off the top of my head where a Diamond Star is manufactured, but it is a foreign manufactured airplane, but it is a US civil registered aircraft. So in this case, yes, they must have comply with all the FAA ADs, uh, and I'm, I'm not familiar with that. There might be some documentation that the manufacturer provides that, hey, when we come up with SDs and what was a TN, a technical note. So I guess that's what Germany uses instead of a service bulletin. Um, depending on how they write it, that might become essentially required uh, documentation processes, materials, and so forth. So it's all up to the manufacturer, how they write, how they word these documents. And this is also kind of points to why it's important to use a shop that's familiar with your airplane. If you fly a Diamond Star, take it over to Long Beach. I, I forget the name of the shop, but there's a shop at Long Beach that works on Diamond Stars. They know that airplane inside and out. They know the rules. They know the manufacturer. They've established that relationship. Uh, similarly, if you got a Cessna, you go take it to Tom's over at, at uh, uh, Long Beach or uh, Foothill up at um, uh, Cable that these people have a long established, very deep relationship with the manufacturer. They know all these answers and they can help you out. I'm just a guy out here flying the airplane. So <laughs> that's about the extent of my experience with it. So in, in summary, what I will say is you should get familiar with these documents, uh, all these types of documents. Keep a copy, uh, a hard copy in your aircraft files uh, with these ICAs, and put them in a, a separate binder actually that the document there on uh, service bulletins and, and SAIBs tells you, you should put, a, this, put it in this document that you hand on the mechanic when it's time to do an inspection. I also keep a, a copy of them on my iPad uh, to the extent possible. And that way I have it as a reference if I'm ever in the field somewhere and something comes up, I've, I've got the documents right there. You know, I've got this iPad that I've used for a number of years and it, it's, it's got a ton of space in it. I keep putting more and more of these documents in there and it never gets any thicker and it never gets any heavier. It's weird, I don't know how that happens, magic. Uh, but the big thing is stay tuned. Uh, you can subscribe to notifications of airworthiness directives and SAIBs, uh, that, that link I gave you. Uh, if you follow a couple clicks down there, there's a link there that you can subscribe. So every now and again, I get an, uh, an email from the FAA that tells me, hey, there's this airworthiness directive that might uh, apply to your uh, equipment. So. Uh, make that a part of your scam. Uh, stay tuned in. And, and, and if you're a part of the maintenance of your aircraft, if you join the team that's going to keep your aircraft airworthy, then you'll be familiar with these things. And that will allow you to be a safer pilot and a better pilot. And, and most importantly, a, uh, a, a better aircraft owner. Might even save you a little bit of money here and there. And I see there in the Q&A, Kent Dellenbush, who, by the way, uh, is the editor of Cessna Flyer and Piper Flyer. If you own one of those kinds of airplanes, you really should join his organization. They've got a beautiful monthly magazine, with great columns on maintenance for these aircraft and great tips. And, and he says, uh, if you use any kind of an alcohol-based product, that will uh, prematurely deteriorate touch screens. That's absolutely true. And he's a, uh, got a background in the medical field. And this is true in the medical field as well. So uh, do nothing more than a mild soap-based solution. Uh, and ideally, as you saw with the Garmin, uh, they recommend water. And usually that's all it takes to clean it up. Uh, and if you use a, 
a microfiber type cloth. It's real easy to get rid of the fingerprints and, and so forth. You know, my 530 is not a touchscreen navigator, but man, there's fingerprints all over the screen on it all the time. I don't know who's doing that, but when I catch them, uh, I'm going to ring them up. It's probably me. So why do I say you should do all these things and be familiar with these documents? The answer is, is real simple. It's in FAR 91.7. The pilot in command of a civil aircraft is responsible for determining whether that aircraft is conditioned for safe flight. Not the mechanic, not the IA, not the dispatcher at the flight school. They all have a part in it, but the pilot in command is responsible. So this allows you to be a better, more effective, safer owner if you're more familiar with all the aspects of owning and operating your aircraft. So with that, I'll close it out. And uh, if you want WINGS credit for this event, if you're attending this online with us tonight on Wednesday evening, uh, your WINGS credits will be granted automatically using the email address that you registered for the program. So you don't have to worry about that. If you attended more than about 30 minutes of this, the webinar tonight, you'll automatically get your credit. And that should happen in a couple of days. If you're watching a recording of this and still want to receive WINGS credit for it, you can send an email, ad, ad, email to that email address. And uh, Gary, if you would post that in the chat box there for me. Yes, it's been posted. While you're at it. And that WP number, that WP05 is the Long Beach uh, FISDO area. And the number there is the event code. If you make sure to include that in the subject line or, or at least in the body of the email, I will make sure you get your credit. And this will happen within about a week or so. So uh, thank you so much for allowing me to speak on a subject I know little about. I had to do a lot of research for this one. I, I kind of had a little working knowledge of most of this, uh, but it's always good to get back in the books and have these discussions with people and, and uh, figure out what's going on. Uh, you'll get a better airplane out of it. You'll get a safer airplane out of it and uh, maybe save a little bit of money along the way. So that's all I've got for you, Gary. Well, thank you very much as usual. Mike Jesh is just a wealth of information. Uh, this is the second in a series of three. So next week, we do have a, a real mechanic, not just pilot weenies like Mike and I that, that twist the wrench in, you know, under supervision, but a guy that actually knows what he's doing. Uh, is it 30 years behind a wrench or is it 40 years? It's 40. 40 years behind a wrench is the yeah. name of it. So uh, obviously, uh, he, he knows what he's doing. So I think... You know, a yeah, lot of the Steve things Ells that... will be speaking next week. And uh, if you uh, subscribe to the Cessna Flyer or Piper Flyer, you're familiar. He writes a column for them. He's kind of their go-to uh, guru on aviation maintenance over there. He's a great guy. Uh, he actually flew with me to Oshkosh a few years ago. And, and uh, you know, for an 80-something-year-old curmudgeon, we had a great time on that trip. And he, we, we still each talk about it. We had a really fun time. He's a good guy. He knows his stuff. Uh, he flies and maintains a Comanche. Uh, so he's used to finding good ways to, to maintain that aircraft. And it's a pretty nice little airplane, I got to say. Good way to go to Oshkosh. You know, if something goes wrong with your airplane, you know, it could get <laughs> fixed along the way. Yeah. And, and interestingly, we flew there uh, right before the airworthiness directive on the cylinders on my engine came out. It was uh, an SAIB at that point. And it was in the comment period for the airworthiness directive. And my cylinders were affected by it. So we're, we're chugging along on these six cylinders that are going to get a, a stake driven through them in a couple of months with this, with this AD. And he, he said at one point, he says, man, it's a shame to have to put these cylinders down. They're purring along so nicely. But, you know, a couple of months later, out comes this AD and I, I get to spend another $15,000 on new cylinders for my airplane. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I came back from Hamburg from the uh, Airbus factory with a new Airbus. And there were two mechanics on board that was part of that. And of course, it's great because this way, if oil needs to be added to the engine on the way or some other thing needs to be deferred, uh, they're there to do it. And of course, they inspected it to, to take it from the factory, too. But it's nice having the uh, mechanics on board with us. Yeah, your, your likelihood of being able to continue if you end up having to land out somewhere is, is a little bit higher that way. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs>